You know, it's in, in atmospheres like this that the trajectory of my life has been set. I remember in 2017, it was December, we had just come home from Florida. I was at probably one of the lowest points in my life. She had been disabled for about four years and no sign of it getting better. And actually I was, I know you think in December, what are you out mowing for? Well, if you saw all the trees, I was doing leaf cleanup and I uh, had to do it one last time. And all of a sudden God spoke to me and he said, if you'll listen to me, I'll give you 10 principles that will accelerate you financially, physically, and spiritually. Well, I'm no dummy. So I said, let's go. So the, the beginning of the year came. We were doing 21 days of prayer and fasting. It was the last weekend. And it was Friday night, very similar to this. And the service was winding down. The altar call had been made. And I just, you know, I, I would sit up front. And, I, and I'll explain why I sit up front here in a minute. But I would sit there. But I was standing there that night. And the entire room went black. Now nobody else saw this except for me. As far as everybody else concerned, all the lights were on. But everything went black. And all I saw was an outdoor stage with me standing on it preaching. I have no idea what I was preaching. I have no idea anything about it. And the only thing I heard God say was, souls, souls, souls. The entire thing went black. It came up again. There I am standing on that outdoor stage. And he said, souls, souls, souls. I said, God, I am not an evangelist. He said, good, go do the work of an evangelist. So I've never put that label on me. I just go do the work because that's what I was told to do. For the next two years, nothing really happened. Yeah, I went to El Salvador. Yeah, I saw thousands of people in attendance, 10,000 each night. But I was just a part of that, which was fine. I was learning. Then 2020 comes and it looks like everything's about to start flowing into place. Except COVID happens. I was mad. I'm telling you, I was mad. I was so mad, I thought, you know what, devil? Right in the middle of this, when everybody's thinking we should still be locked down, and, and some states were still locked down, I said, we're going to do a crusade. And so we did. Had about 120 people show up. From the community. We got a lot of hate mail, but I didn't really care. So then what happened was, is again, in this atmosphere, all of a sudden I saw a tent up at my church for a full month. I told my wife, I said, hey, this is what I see, Julie. And she said, well, that's good. You'll probably be the only one there because I'm not even coming. Because I don't see it. So anyway... So anyway, I said, well, if it's over my head, go over my head. So I went to my pastor. I said, this is what I see. He said, good, I've been wanting to do it. Let's do it. So for the entire month of July, it's cold here tonight compared to July in Kentucky. But for the entire month of July, we had a tent revival every single night. In the middle of that, Scott Willis was there. He was the one preaching that night. It has nothing to do with him, but I know Scott Willis has been here, so I just thought I'd name drop. <laughs> I hate it when people do that. Anyway. <laughs> As he's preaching, all of a sudden, I see tents across America. And I hear one thing. How can you stay? You can't ask God, how can I go? The question you need to ask him is, how can I stay? I leaned over to my pastor. I happened to be sitting right next to him at the time. And I said, this is what I've seen. I'm going home. I'll see you tomorrow. And I left. By the next time I got back to church that next night, half the church knew. I thought, I haven't told you that confidence. But, you know, it's all good. 
So if you wonder why we do what we do, it's because we had marching orders to do it. God called us to do it. In the presence of God, God showed us what to do. Now we're at a place that we're crying out for God to show us what to do because there's been a shift. And so it's like, God, we don't want to just do what we've always been doing. If you're saying to do not necessarily something different, but what are you actually saying? And, you know, we go to city after city, and some might think, what kind of impact are you making when there's a handful of people there? Because we don't ask anybody for anything. We spend our own money. We do our own thing. If, if they came to me and said, hey, the electric bill for, for the week was $500, I'd write them a check for $500. Because I literally ask for nothing. Now, most churches aren't going to do that. But our whole desire is for the church because, listen, pastors are depleted. They give and they give and they give. It's one of the hardest jobs in America. Probably one of the hardest jobs in the world Amen. is to be a pastor. Amen. Because you constantly give and you know in the back of your mind at some point somebody you're giving everything to and you love is either going to stab you in the back and betray you or is going to walk away. So I get kind of upset when people start bad-mouthing pastors. And I tell pastors, I said, look, you want to know if you're bad mouth? Pay attention to how the kids respond to you. Because then that'll tell you what kind of name you have in each house. But we go because I know religion isn't going to turn a city around. You come to Richmond, people are sitting there. Well, I knew revival. My grandmother, my great-grandmother went revival. And I know revival. Well, if you knew revival, then you would have already turned this city around. Right. But you're too stuck in pride to actually bend your knee and get what you need from God. Because what you're doing isn't working. Right. Government policies are not going to turn this city around. Throwing money at a situation and not touching people's lives isn't going to turn this city around. It's going to take an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that touches hearts and changes lives. I'm telling you right now, God is not done with the nations of the world. He's not done with America. He's not done with the state of Indiana. And he's not done with the city of Richmond. God is going to shake this land once again. We are in the first page of the beginning of the last day move of God before Jesus returns to take us home. And I know that it only takes one or two people that will get a burning fire in their spirit that can turn this city around. So I don't really care about crowds. Never have. Because I'm reading the Bible where Jesus went to a well and one woman showed up. And all of a sudden the entire town got flipped upside down because he did one woman. Man, man shouldn't be a minister. Well, then that town wouldn't have got flipped upside down if they weren't. Because she became an evangelist. God doesn't set you on fire and send you out to be a lone ranger. But you're supposed to be a body. But most pastors are so concerned that they're going to lose a member. Yeah. My pastor says it like this. He says, I don't ever make a member out of anybody. Because if I make a member out of them, I'm responsible for them. But if God makes a member out of them, then God's responsible for them. And he also says this, that every time somebody leaves the church, it's church split in his mind. Will people take advantage of you? Yes, they will. They will. Will they take and never give? Yep. But you have to look past that and go after the one. I see this place right here as a beacon of light. 
I see this as a lighthouse that warns people of the coming judgment. I see this place as a rescue station that provides safety. I see it as a place of compassion that loves family through the children. I see it as a truth train that doesn't care what your feelings say, but is willing to tell you the truth, even if it upsets you. And I see this place as a house of breakthrough that will take you from poverty to financial freedom. Will all want it? No, they won't. Because they're comfortable in who they are. But I see this property radically transformed. I can see this entire building gone. I can see a new church here. I can see a playground here for kids. Why? Because there's people in this church that can see it. And when they spoke it, I can see it. Like I said at the beginning of the service. If you can't see it, it's never going to happen. Now you might not get the full picture, I understand that. You might not even understand what you're seeing. But all of a sudden you step into it and you're like, this is what he was showing me and I know I'm in the right place. I'm telling you transformation's coming. Because there's a difference here. Why? You may say, why are they? Because I know this family. I trust this family. I trust the pastors of this church. And you want to know something else? God trusts them. Amen. Yes, pastors, they've seen some things. They've seen hurt. They've even been hurt. They've seen abuse. They may be the ones who've taken the abuse. But I know that they want to make sure things are right according to God. They want to please God. How do I know that? Because that's my heart. And there's a connection. But I know that they have faith. They're not built on emotions. They're built on faith. And how do I know that? Because they couldn't please God without faith. You see, it's the heart cry of every child, whether he is in the house or not, to hear their father say, I'm well pleased in you. Even Jesus had to hear it. As he came up out of the baptismal waters, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. First Corinthians 10. I'm going to read a few verses here. Starting in verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud as they passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food, drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So that rock that poured water out. How many of you have ever seen a rock in real life grow legs and begin to walk? This rock followed them. I'm not saying it grew legs and walked, but I'm just saying God somehow picked it up and took it with them. I don't know how it happened. This is going to be one of those things when I get into heaven, I'm going to the theater room, and I'm going to say, put that in the best thing you got. It's going to be like surround sound and, and you know, full immersion. I'll be like, look at that rock, man. That's how you did it. Man, that's awesome. Do I think we're going to be able to do that? I really do. If I'm wrong, well, I'm still there, so that's good. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Listen, there are some things in the Word of God you don't claim. There are examples to you of what not to do. People, You tell people that, that God wants to bless them. What about Paul? What about Paul? Before Paul ever stepped foot and started doing what God told him to do, God told him what was going to happen. Paul said, yes, let's go. Paul knew what was coming. He agreed to it. So you don't have to claim everything Paul went through. That doesn't mean you run. He never ran. He did what he was called to do. Verse 7. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. You must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. You must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did. And were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did. And were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. 
but they were written down for our instruction on whom the ends of the ages has come. So ain't nothing different. God ain't changed. In other words, he said, look, you saw what happened? You think you can live by your so-called grace? Do whatever you want, and it's okay? It's not. It's not. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. And with the temptation, he will always provide a way to escape that you may be able to endure. So there's, there's always victory. He provides the way in everywhere. If you aren't an overcomer, you are the problem. God's never the problem. He gives you the answer. You just ain't listening. Goes back to what we talked about last night. It's because you want to be in control. Yeah. If you'll let God be in control, He'll show you how to overcome everything that comes your way. Amen. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not in participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not in participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one bread. We, who are many, are one body, for we partake of one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifice participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want to be participant with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake in the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to danger or to jealousy? Are we stronger than him? So actually, when you step into control, living your own life, doing what you want to do, away from God, what you're doing is you're provoking God to jealousy and saying, I know better than you. Last February of 23, when, when the revival broke out at Asbury, and in one single day, 30,000 people descended upon that small town. I mean, they can't handle that. They can't handle... They got one restaurant in the entire town. It's Subway, and it's not even any good. At least that's what I've been told. But I watched people. I watched people try to use that to gain followers on social media. I told God I refused to do that. I went down there. I never went live. I never did anything. I watched people. There was a man of God who prophesied that that was coming. He prophesied it in 2014 that there was a move of God coming to the state of Kentucky that would shape the land. People took, he went there. The first day it broke out. I mean, if you prophesy something and all of a sudden it happens, you don't want to be there. So he drove all the way up there. He just documented it. That's all he did. He wasn't trying to get anything. He went from 5,000 subscribers to 20,000 overnight just by documenting. Never tried to raise a dime off of it. Never did anything other than to document it. But people shared his post and tried to make raise money off of it for themselves. You see, revival can get messy. Because there's a lot of people who want to piggyback things, but they don't want to pay the price themselves. There was a guy one time, I don't know if he's still alive, but he used to warn people before he preached that things were going to get interesting. Because as he preached, God would begin to reach down into the hearts of people and begin to heal emotional trauma. And they would just, in the middle of his sermon, while he was just talking, they begin to weep and wail. But he said, in everything I've seen, I've watched people even get a touch from God and turn around and get divorced. Because they're not willing to stay the road. They just can't handle what's happening. I've watched people come out of full-blown revivals and lose their ever-loving mind. Because it was more about what God gave them to do. It was more about the work of the Lord than it was the Lord of the work. When you lose focus, things are going to begin to rapidly change. Now don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying let's avoid it. 
because the, there's great things that come from it. The world got touched out of three weeks or however long it was of the Asbury Revival before they shut it down. The world's still being impacted a year and a half later by that outpouring. Because God begins to change things. But what happens is, is if you ain't right, the cream and the crap all rise to the top. Now when revival hit our church in 1994, I wasn't there yet. But our pastors were going through one of the worst attacks. Nobody knew it. People were coming from around the world to be a part of the meetings. And, and during the day, they're under the greatest attack that they had ever been in. Wasn't their fault. Pretty much they inherited it from the previous pastor, and they're the ones having to deal with it. You see, when God begins to move, you store up, stir up a hornet's nest, so to speak. And if you're not grounded in this word, you're not going to be able to stand. We we stirred up some minor. We just we we kicked a wasp or something like that this week, but it got dealt with quickly. You see, because when God begins to move, all of a sudden problems, corruption, and evil begins to be exposed. There's a story, I think it, what, what, it's, it's only uh, cookie dough. Look up It's Only Cookie Dough. It's a documentary. It'll blow your mind. It was, a, it was a county down in Kentucky that a couple pastors decided to take the entire drug cartel of that county to task. And, and it went up every line. I think 65% of the police force was involved in it. Got arrested. Politicians, judges, state things. The FBI told the pastor, if you ever have a cop from your county or even a state patrol get behind you, do not pull over for them. They said, they gave him a card. They said, call this number and we will come rescue you. Do not pull over. He said, because you probably won't live. They had hits out on them. Because of the, the exposure of the corruption. But it's called, it was only cookie dough. They did a documentary on it. But what happens is, is people get a touch and they think, and then they're like, you know, I'm just not going to be able to make it tonight. People have been touched here all week. Where are they at tonight? I, I, I just find it humorous to me, humorous in a sarcastic way, that people allow things to get in their way when they're really getting touched. But that's okay. Someone once asked my pastor, what he thought about revival. And he said, I'd give this right arm for revival. Shortly thereafter, he was in a boating accident and nearly had his arm ripped out of his body. He was born and raised in revival. It's all he's ever known. In 2014, a man was preaching a message, just a normal Sunday morning, and all of a sudden Jesus walked in the back door. The entire church fell on their face for the next five or six hours. Nobody could move. This is where that word came in that said that there's a move of God coming to the state of Kentucky that would shake the land. For the next year, they went up and down the panhandle of Florida every week holding revival services. There were four pastors that were semi-involved in this move. They came to the meetings. They were part of it. See, things start to get exposed. That's why people are afraid of them. Three of them ended up in prison. One was running a drug cartel out of his church, selling drugs out of his church. Two other ones, let's just say that there were some sexual things going on. Like I said, my pastor gave his life to revival. One day he was driving in, in, in uh, Texas past the school. And he said, God, give me that school. And God immediately spoke back to him and said, Son, I've given you that school. He called the, 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 the principal and said, Hey, I want to do an assembly. Christian assembly. This was many years ago. He said, All right. I'll give you a half an hour. He wasn't too enthusiastic. My pastor said, I don't want a half an hour. I want an hour. And he said, Fine, I'll give you an hour. They went and they preached the gospel made the altar call. 
one person, one little girl, came up, and as she came up, she was saying, I'm under conviction. I'm under conviction. I'm under conviction. And that's why my grandma tells me I'm so mean. That one little girl sparked something, and in the next month, a thousand young people came to Christ in one month's time in that school district. Hallelujah. This is what I try to get in the hearts of people. God can shake a community. In one month, he can turn a thousand kids in a school district. When he was pastoring in Texas, he would be praying in the Holy Spirit. And he'd be going along, and all of a sudden, he'd just say, Cincinnati. For two years, that happened to him. As he prayed in the Spirit, he would say, Cincinnati. He said, my God, there must be somebody in heaven, or somebody in Cincinnati that really needs prayer. And it only took the one at Asbury as well. Well, in Florence, Kentucky, there happened to be a pastor who had a moral failure and got kicked out of the kicked out of the church. And there was a board member who was leading the cause to to find a new pastor. And they had a couple people come in, and, and it wasn't just wasn't it. He comes home. This board member comes home one night. And there's a man sitting in his easy chair. He knew him. Well, I talked about this man a couple of nights ago. It was Hubert Lindsay, better known as Ole Hubert. As I mentioned before, Bill Bright and Billy Graham both said he was the father of the Jesus movement. He's sitting there, and I told some stories about him the other night. I'm not going to tell them again. But like I said the other night, when Ronald Reagan was the governor of California and a, and a riot broke out at Berkeley, he called this one man, that one man stood in the midst of all those kids and broke up that entire riot, just like that. So he walks in and he's sitting in that chair and he said, you found the pastor yet? He said, no, we haven't found one yet, but we got this guy from Texas, he's got a weird name. He jumped up out of that easy chair, grabbed the phone, dialed the number, and then handed the phone to the board member and said, here's your next pastor, and he called to let him keep it. He was a prophet. I mean, things, this is all, this is what, this is what a life in the presence of God does. He said, why are you telling all these stories? Because this is what a life in the presence of God does. It takes you into places. Listen, revival broke out of Heritage, 1994. One day my pastor's up preaching and a man walks in the back door. He's beat down. His suit's dirty. His hair's all messed up. Looks like he hasn't showered in a week and that he's just been beat up. And as he comes up the, the middle aisle, he steadies himself on each one of the rows. My pastor's up preaching a message. Nobody sees this man but him. He said, he said, I couldn't stop preaching because they already thought we were crazy. People in the community thought we lost our mind. Now I'm not telling there's a man walking up the middle in a dirty thing. He said when he got to the front, he made a turn like this. And when he turned like this, a huge pond of water in the front of the sanctuary opened up. That man just turned and he took one step in, he was ankle deep. Next step in, he was knee deep. Next step in, he was waist deep. Then he took three swimming strokes. Then it was waist deep, knee deep, ankle deep. When he came out of that water, he was a completely different man. His suit was perfect. His hair was crisp. He was freshly shaved. He looked at my pastor. He went like this to like give him a high five. And then he turned around and walked right through the wall. He never stopped preaching, never said anything, never told anybody. He said a couple nights, a couple days later, I was mowing grass. He said, I said, God, what in the world was that? He said, I opened up a water hole at your church. You say, why'd you sit in the front row? Because I was sitting right where that water hole is still active today, 30 years later. He said, as long as you don't put a denominational name on it, as long as you don't try to raise money on it, 
I'll never shut it down. I can tell you people from around the world, including myself, have been refreshed in that watering hole. Because he's never put a denominational name on it. He's never built anything on it. He's never raised one dime on it. When a revival broke out down in Florida in 2008, I won't even mention the name. You can figure it out. But there was a pastor about an hour away. I struggled with it. People were, again, flocking there. But there was something about the preacher that just didn't sit right with me. But one of the local pastors down there told his entire staff, he said, if I see any of you at that meeting, you're fired on the spot. Well, it turned out that man ended up having a moral failure in the middle of what was called a revival. Left his wife, married another woman. So, not everything that's labeled God is God, which is why you have to have the Word of God and the Holy Spirit active in your life. Now, I have told you many times, if you've ever heard me preach, that I have a spirit of I don't care. By that, I mean I don't care what you think about me. I don't care what you say about me. I've had plenty of people say things about me. I've had people do things online. I don't care. Because what happened was, is I was sitting in a meeting just like this. And I cried out. And I said, arise, O God, and kill, break off that man-pleasing spirit. And from that day to this day, he broke that off. And I've never had a problem with just caring what anybody thinks about me. I mean, I do like it if they like me. Don't get me wrong. I mean, that's nice. But if you don't like me, bless you. Carry on. That's all, that's all right. You know what revival does? You know what the presence of God does? It takes a boy like me who is absolutely scared to death of public speaking. That freezes if you put a mic in his face. That absolutely shake out of his gourd and turns him into somebody with Holy Ghost boldness that can stand before you and tell you that God loves you. He healed, healed me of the fear of public speaking. There's nothing he can't do. You see, when the presence of God shows up, healing begins to take place. A lot of times you might not even know it. You get home and you're like, man, I just realized I didn't. You know, I just realized that for five days I've been sleeping through the night. Yeah. I don't even remember praying for it. Because it's not about that. It's the presence of God. Even if we did pray for it, it's still the presence of God. Now this week we've gone over Matthew 8. The four diseases God healed. Jesus healed. Diseases of the flesh. Nervous system. Central nervous system. Disease of the blood. Demons. Talked about emotional things last night. Luke 13, 11. Have you ever... Is there anybody here? I know people like this. I'll just see if there's anybody here. Is there anybody here that... They just can't figure out what's wrong with you? Physically, like you got you got something, you know something's wrong, but you go to the doctor and I like we don't have a clue. Anybody? What I have found is when that is the case, what that is is a spirit of infirmity. Luke thirteen verse eleven says this, and behold, there was a woman who had a dis disabling spirit for eighteen years. She was bent over. And could not fully strengthen herself. Sometimes it's just, that's why they can't figure it out. Because it's a spirit of infirmity attacking the body. My pastor likes to tell people that our church got healed of ADHD. <laughs> Meaning, we don't care about the time. He would tell people all the, mir most, the greatest miracles take place after 11 p.m. Because when God begins to move, time becomes irrelevant. Because all of a sudden, a refreshing happens. In Acts 3, 19 through 20, it says, Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. We go to one church to do these tick revivals. They have an hour and a, long, hour and a half long service Sunday morning. That's it. Hour and a half. In, out, boom. 
And it's not because of the people. That's the pastor. We go there for a tent revival. You know how long our meetings generally are? They're probably three hours plus. He doesn't move. None of the people move. Because the presence of God is there. It's, it's, it's the most amazing thing. When we went to the Asbury Revival, I thought I was there for 10 minutes. I looked at my watch, looked at my phone. I've been there three hours. I thought, my God in heaven, how in the world did this happen? I've only been here 10 minutes. How three hours pass? It was just the raw presence of God. This last day move of God will not be platform driven. If you're seeking a platform, then you'll miss it. I've never sought a platform. I've never sought to be in front of people to preach. I knew I had a call, but I never forced it. I don't force anything. Hey, right. well, this be a good place to network. <laughs> okay. Look, I'm never going to be in charge of the greeting community, committee at the church. <laughs> I'm not going to be the welcoming committee. Generally, if you see me in a church, I'm standing by myself. Julie's like, why aren't you talking to anybody? Well, nobody came to talk to you. That's why I'm not talking about it. Well, did that bother you? Not at all. I had a good time by myself. I'm cool with silence. I don't have to have something always going on or chaos around me or something. I'm fine with just being me. If somebody comes and talks to me, I don't run them off either. Even when I would like to run them off, I don't. I'm very kind. But this is going to be a people-driven movement. You want to know how to make it easy for a preacher to preach? Desire to hear the Word of God from him more than he desires to preach it. The hunger of the people driving the Word. I mean, to be really honest, I'd rather 25 people hungry to, to do something yes. than have 300 people here and then just be like, well, that was a good service. Let me go back to my regular life. Yeah. What good's that? If you go to church on Sunday morning and you leave the same way you came, why'd you waste the time? You might as well stay at home and watch something on TV. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but when I stopped at that whole rock thing, not only did he say the rock moved, but what did he say? The rock was Christ. Now, was the rock actually Jesus Christ? No. But it was a symbol. So, I just want to look at this real quick. Exodus 17, 6. It says, Behold, I stand before you. They are on the rock of Oreb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out from it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So God spoke to Moses. They're crying out for water. He strikes the rock. Water flows. And all the people see it. You want to know what that is? The rock is Christ. You want to watch it? You ready? You want me to use the pole? Or you want me to use the podium for it? The pole. Okay. So he's the only one that spoke. Pretend this is the cross. What happened on the cross? Jesus died on the cross, beaten, strike. He was whipped at a whipping post for your healing. He was hung on that. He was stabbed in the side and blood and water flowed. He was nailed to that. He was beat. His hair pulled out of him. He was the rock that was struck. Then in Numbers 20, Starting in verse 2, it says this. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that, would that we had perished with our brothers when our brothers perished before the Lord? Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness, that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And, we have, and why have you made us come up out of Egypt? And bring us to this evil place. Yeah, like, like slavery was a real great thing. But this is the evil place. Okay, just interesting. 
It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Then Aaron and Moses went from the presence of the assembly, entered the tent of meeting, and fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. So here's Moses and Aaron before the entire congregation, and they're complaining and grumbling. Follow me? So what did they do? They left that presence. They left the presence of complaining and grumbling, and they went to the presence of God. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, Take the staff, assemble the congregation, you and Aaron and your brothers, and tell the rock, speak to the rock, before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock from them and drink for the entire congregation and their cattle. Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he was commanded. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water from this rock? And Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. So they're before the congregation, grumbling and complaining. They leave that presence. They go into the presence of God. He then leaves the presence of God. He comes back to the congregation. He didn't bring the presence with him. He reassembled back with them. And he took on their grumbling. And then he disobeyed God. God still performed the miracle. But it was out of disobedience. That's what a lot of Christians do. We come to the cross the very first time. God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me, Jesus. You see, the cross is a bridge between the land of the dead and the land of the living. And when we step across that bridge of the cross into the land of the living, now we're here. We're now in the shadow of the cross in a relationship. But too often we're like Moses when we make a mistake. We come back out here to the land of the dead and start all over to the smitten rock, to the rock that was struck. And then so what happens is we're just in this constant circle going around the cross, going around the cross. When the entire time was you come in once and then you speak to the rock. You have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I never have to go back over to the land of the dead. I can speak to the rock. The only time is I come this close to say, come home, come home. Come home! How many times are you going to go around that before the devil grabs you and pulls you back into the world? Yeah. That's a good word. You know, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. There's going to be times God asks you to do things you don't want to do. But does he have your yes? Does he have your yes? Are you still like the Israelites taking another trip around the mountain, taking another trip around the cross? Like Moses, constantly going back to the rock that's been beaten instead of going to the glorified Christ who's raised from the dead and now sits at the right hand of the Father. You see, when I'm on this side, God confirms His Word into my heart in the form of results. Over here, I can believe his word all I want, but I'm probably not going to see too many results because I'm in the wrong place. It's actually impossible to be a discouraged Christian. It's unbiblical. Because I'm not relating to my life. I'm relating to the word of God that's life. I don't want to relate to anything that doesn't produce life. If you're discouraged, go talk to somebody about Jesus. Because the Bible promises that a soul winner will have joy. You see, you can't preach or you can't even talk about what you're not living. 
Too many people's theology or belief of what the Bible says is based on the circumstances or the things happening in their life. No, what I believe about the Bible is based on the life of Jesus and what's written in this word. You see, this Bible will keep you out of sin. But sin will keep you out of this Bible. I'm telling you, America will not survive without the church. But the church will survive without America. If you've ever asked yourself, why in the world isn't America mentioned in the book of Revelation? I've heard people try to fit it in there. Because I think when the rapture happens, America will become irrelevant because there's going to be too many people taken. Amen. Even as bad as things look, overnight it could become no longer the most powerful nation in the world. It's just one possible reason. I'm not saying that is. I don't know that for sure. But when you're on this side of the cross, guess what you're in? You're in a dry season. Look, God just got me in a season of waiting. Oh, who told you that? Because the Word of God never told you that. The Word of God never told you you were in a dry season. Because if I'm on this side of the cross living in the shadow, I'm in the land of the living, in the land of life, where the water flows. There's no dry season. I'm planted by the streams of water. That even in drought time, my leaves do not wither. The only reason why you're there is because you keep saying it. And that is why too many people are perpetually stagnant, never moving forward. Today, you need to change your confession. See, it's one thing to say you love God. I know a lot of people that say they love God. But it's an entirely different thing to actually love God. Jesus said this in John 14, 23 and 24. If anyone loves me, he will keep my words. He who does not love me does not keep my words. It's a life of obedience. I know that there's a lot of preachers today that, you know, they want to talk about, look, I understand what the cross purchased for me. I understand what Jesus did for me. I believe in all that. But I believe there has to be an activation to it. You ask God for a miracle, God's going to give you an instruction. Holiness is the foundation of Christianity. If you don't have victory over sin, you cannot carry God's presence. You're not going to experience the things I've talked about tonight. I've lived a life apart from God. I've lived a life with God. I ain't ever going back. The reason why people go back is this right here. Never really figuring out who they are in the living Christ, not the dead Christ. He's no longer a baby in the manger. He's not a guy on a cross anymore. He is the resurrected Christ. Who's never tasted death a second time. Who's coming back again in the clouds. He's not a pretty little boy with blue eyes. His eyes are flames of fire. As long as you stay on the wrong side of the cross, all of the things that he bought for you, all of the things he purchased for you for by his blood will elude you. Yes. You can be like Moses who set aside the presence of God. He was in the glory. The glory cloud dropped down on the place. Heard the word of God. But then he came back out to the grumblers and complainers. And he set it aside. He lowered the standard to their level. You see, I believe that God can take a dirty, no good, rotten sinner. Take them out of that situation. Bring them over here. Clean them up. Bring them to peace. Then take them and put them back in that place and keep them clean. That's right. The same power it took to save you from hell is the same power that keeps you from going there. Amen. He can keep you. If he can cleanse you, he can keep you clean. Yes. 